special thanks to our guest speakers who have agreed to take part today and of you uh, of all of you of course who are who are sat in front of the computer instead of um, enjoying the hottest day of the year. Um, I understand tomorrow is going to be even hotter, so we've got 24 hours to enjoy this lovely sun. Um, so before we start today's event, um, we would just like to inform you that we are recording this teaching so that we can put it on our website and on social media for those people who could not attend today but would be interested in what, 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 was just what is going to be discussed. So if you don't want to have your um, record, you, if you don't want to be recorded on this teaching, there's the option of just messaging um, myself or Nishma at the end and um, you will be taken off the published recording. Um, so for those of you who are uh, who have not come across the Rights Collective before, um, my name is Anjali. Um, I am the co-founder um, of the Rights Collective with um, Nishma who has kindly offered to deal with the tech side of things today. Um, my background is that I'm a lawyer. Um, I specialize in commercial insurance, so completely unrelated to um, women's rights or um, the NHS or any medical profession. Um, but um, we decided to create a group of South Asian women working towards tackling um, distinct and often ways um, in which women are disempowered and inequality effects within the South Asian diaspora in the community in the form of um, the Rights Collective. Um, and we explore this in public and private domains. So at the Rights Collective, we believe it is our duty to dismantle the subvert and, um, sorry, dismantle and subvert some of these norms within our own spaces. And we do this um, through three pathways. The first pathway is breaking the silence. So we seek to focus on the understanding of um, lived experiences within our communities, building trust and strong relationships amongst our peers, creating safe spaces to allow individuals to talk about their experiences more openly and honestly. And I, I feel that this teaching today for really does feel within this category, albeit that we're not focusing on um, gender um, uh, uh, in the teaching but it, it does fall within that, that category. Um, we want to secondly create um, and cultivate a new culture um, and we would like to do this by moving towards raising awareness of oppressive structures that exist in the world at large um, and then are replicated within our own communities and allow gender inequality and other marginalizations to persist. And we hope to move towards creating a safer, safer, more radical and hopeful community. Um, our third, um, third area, which we like to focus on, is co-creating spaces for support. So we are working to bring together a hub of support of services which might support women in um, our community in times of need. Having had many individuals reach out to us, um, we recognise the need for a resource that can guide them, even when they are unable to support. Uh, un even though, even though we may not provide the support directly, we have contacts within the relevant fields who can who can assist. So, today's teaching is part of um, a series of events called Ikata, a digital gathering of arts poetry, teaching, solidarity sessions, workshops, um, for, um, and more for our communities um, under lockdown. This series is a result of our team examining how we can express solidarity within our community and with those struggling at this time. So um, IGATA aims to provide a safe, joyful and learning space for all of us. And if you are interested in collaborating with us going forwards, um, please get in contact with us um, after the event uh, and we can see what, what more we can do um, for our community. So coming to today's event, um, when thinking about what voices we should platform in the context of the pandemic, we recognise that there are specific experiences which have been encountered by the BAME community in particular. And we are keen to invite some of these individuals to share the experiences of uh, with us. The format of this evening will be that um, our three guest speakers will be given 10 minutes um, 
will give us 10 minutes of their time to discuss a, cho a chosen topic and then we will have um, time for questions at the end. Um, what what I suggest is that we, because there are there's a massive audience that um, I understand um, I'm communicating to, even though there's just one small camera in the computer which I'm talking to at the minute. Um, I suggest that you um, post the um, questions in the chat function. Um, so I mistakenly thought it was at the bottom of my screen, but I think it's on the top. In my screen, it's on the top right-hand corner where I can I can just click on chat and you can just message something um, on there. Um, so our first speaker is um, Dr. Marty. Um, he is a senior consultant physician working in Kingsland, Norfolk. He's born and raised in Jaffna, Sri Lanka, where he qualified as a doctor in the mid 80s. Dr. Mathi has now been working in the NHS for 25 years in both clinical and managerial capacities. He's been privy to many challenges and successes the NHS has journeyed through, through this time. And he plans to share his experience on the front line during the pandemic and how this can be used to enlighten, enlighten future medical practice. Our second speaker is Dr. Nero. Um, Dr. Nero graduated at St. George's Medical School in London in 2012. She completed a first class um, intercalated BSc at UCL, and now she works as a GP in Barnet. Um, she has a keen interest in medical education, and having been awarded GP Tutor of the Year 2020, um, she is involved in extensive charitable organisations, um, Dr. Nero will be shedding a light on how time has impacted people's mental health and ways to cope with these changes. Our third speaker um, is Yasmin Sultan, who is a graduate pharmacist working in a hospital and community pharmacy um, during the pandemic. Uh, she graduated in King's, uh, from King's College in London um, with an M-Farm degree and has a mixed Iranian and Iraqi heritage. So um, I think I've spoken enough. <laughs> I'm going to um, firstly invite Dr. Mathi to um, to commence his presentation on um, on his experiences in the NHS. Angelina, thank you for this kind introduction. Wanakam and Namaste. First of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be here with you all today, and also amongst my fellow speakers. Those of you who don't know me, as Angelina mentioned, I'm a consultant physician and a gastroenterologist based at Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Kingsley, West Norfolk. Incidentally, I'm also sonic as dad, but I would rather be known as Uncle of Whitey, who I believe in the audience today. I don't need to overstate to this audience just how bad and unprecedented this pandemic has been globally, as well as within the UK. This has caused innumerable change to our social, personal, and professional lives. My life as a doctor has changed beyond recognition and maybe forever. What I propose to do over the next 10 minutes or so is to highlight some of the challenges we faced in the NHS and talk about the positives that have arisen from this and the lessons learned and the directions for the future. As you probably aware that NHS was was founded in 1948, just over 70 years ago. The founding principle by Nee Bevan was to provide a universal, equitable, comprehensive, high quality healthcare free at the point of delivery. This mandate is being tested now more than any time since its establishment 70 years ago. We all know that I don't have to remind you that NHS has been chronically underfunded, understaffed, and undervalued with limited infrastructure and should I also say the limited man and woman power. In these dangerous times, we are up against unprecedented challenges, exposed vulnerabilities in many fronts, but unexpectedly we have also seen some positive effects. This is what I hope to touch on over the next uh, eight to 10 minutes. Since the beginning of the pandemic, all of the NHS hospitals uh, were focused on caring patients with COVID-19 infections. We quickly realized that this is not sustainable. At the same time, we also knew what we were practicing before 
COVID-19 also was equally unsustainable. We were witnessing another pandemic of modern medicine, that of iatrogenic harm, which means that the illness or medical intervention uh, caused by the medical professionals, mainly doctors like myself. Throughout my career over the past three decades within the NHS, I have seen the growth in practice of defensive medicine. Defensive medicine is the root cause of over-diagnosis, over-treatment, over-investigations, and unnecessary intervention and procedures. Research also showed that one third of the pre-COVID admissions in the hospitals were iatrogenic. That was caused by either over-treatment or over-investigations or the findings of an incidental uh, findings. And I'm sure uh, my fellow speaker, Jasmine, will, as a pharmacist, will understand and attest to the over-medicalization, the treatment of patients who are admitted to hospitals. The alternative to defensive medicine, I think we need to prioritize and bring more realistic medicine and choosing wisely. We need to apply more common sense in medicine. Unfortunately, as we all know, it seems common sense is not so common these days. To illustrate this point, I would like to offer a comparison of my clinical duties or clinical practice before and during COVID. Previously, I was performing up to about 20 to 25 endoscopic procedures, both upper GI and lower GI endoscopy. And invariably, nine out of 10 of these investigations were essentially normal. In fact, we were doing, as we would call it, worried well. But currently, I'm performing probably one endoscopic procedure every few weeks in people who actually needs it and warrants it. But these situations exist within extremes, but there's a balance to be found somewhere in the middle. COVID-19 has highlighted the over-investigations occurring within the NHS. I think we need to prioritize a realistic form of medical investigations and to choose wisely to reduce unnecessary treatment. We know that the benefits of testing and treatment are overstated and the harms are downplayed, mainly by the big farms. We need to be honest and have a meaningful conversation with the patient, families and relatives. What is often needed is reassurance and adequate time to explain to patients and relatives about their problems. This unfortunately is not being able to provide it both in the hospital sector as also in the primary care. I'm sure Niru, my colleague and a friend, will be able to relate to this, the amount of patients we have to see within the limited number of times. That is, again, a huge problem for all these unnecessary uh, consultation. We need to make that NHS better and not just go back to the old ways. We also need to build up on lessons learned and seek this opportunity to reset the healthcare and social system for better. I know that I have touched on my uh, important points that I realized over the past 30 years, but I haven't provided that many solutions to the problem. But perhaps it is a conversation that we all need to start. I think that is already gaining momentum in the medical circle, both in North America as well as in the Europe. But I want to tell you something which has we have witnessed, which all of us, I'm sure, will the medical profession will understand. One of the most practical and efficient solutions which we have seen grown during this time is an implementation and use of virtual clinics. These have been absolute godsend. These have allowed doctors to run their clinic efficiently and reduce bureaucracy and actually have increased our time spent with the patient. Of course, there is, uh, the, as everything else, there are downside. There are patients that we need to see them face to face and monitor them physically. And also we have to modify and challenge our communication skills and our diagnostic techniques. But there's no doubt that this particular aspect, what we identified during this pandemic, has revolutionized the way that we are going to be working in future for better, I think, is one of the best things come out of it. Some other benefit we also have seen is that the non-COVID related infections have gone down, both in the pediatric group as well as in the adult group. We also have seen significant number of patients with the underlying lung disease like COPD and their admission rate has gone down with the infective exacerbation. 
mainly because of the procedures that we are adopting, social distancing, frequent hand washing, and other protective measures, and we are engaged in. I hope this trend continues. Lastly, I think this is something that which is very, uh, I'm very passionate about. I would like to touch upon the most salient point of this discussion, the pandemic of racism. It would be remiss of me to talk about this time without acknowledging the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests occurring up and down the country. Racism within the public health crisis was already gaining attention with growing concern about the impact of COVID-19 on individual being background. The Black Lives Matter movement has forced us to re-examine the racism and the, especially the anti-blackness that persists throughout our society and institutions. The NHS is one such institution. As a South Asian doctor, there are vulnerabilities I face, whether that be from my genetic predispositions or systematic and casual racism. I have dealt with racism from colleagues and patients throughout my career. And as we have all seen, uh, BAM NHS staff have been most heavily impacted by COVID-19. But as you probably know, about 20% of the NHS staff are from BAM background. But sadly, if you look at the people who have passed away due to COVID-19, up to 64% of them from BAM background. So there is a disproportionate representation when it comes to the uh, bad outcome. We also know infectious disease is the biological manifestation of social inequality. I also would like to quote one of the other things we mentioned in the futuristic of the, um, the artificial intelligence, where when all these uh, measures are used, we find that ethnic minority representation is minimal in this recruitment of patients as a result, and that will result in inequality as well. We also have seen a uh, recent report that one third of the black and ethnic minority staff in the health service have been bullied, harassed, undermined, or abused by their own colleagues in the past year or so. A recent study showed that black women face five times higher maternal mortality than the white women within the UK. And similarly, Asian women also face a higher risk. These are unacceptable variations. And while there is a systematic change needed, Individuals need to advocate for black and brown patients throughout our patient care. South Asians make up a significant proportion of the NHS workforce, and it is important that we work to eradicate the anti-blackness with our communities in order to ensure we provide the best care to everyone that walks through our doors, regardless of race and religion. The COVID-19 has once again demonstrated that racism is a public health issue and it kills people. Unless the government recognizes this and engages in actions, not just words, the COVID-19 pandemic will continue to disproportionately impact on BAME healthcare workers and the community we serve. And on that front, I know that is something that uh, I've been passionate about. I will stop there, I think, because my time is probably uh, okay, but I'm happy to take up any questions as Angelina mentioned in the introduction. And once again, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mathi. So um, I'm going to encourage people to actually either put the questions on the chat function or just put their hand up in the chat function so they can discuss it. But I also had a, a few questions. Um, I think um, it's you've importantly touched upon racism within the NHS and in the wider public. Um, how have you, how has that impacted on your career to date? Um, or do you feel it's impacted on your career to date? And what more needs to be done for young um, junior doctors who are who are coming up the ranks, um, especially in this time when they, I feel like they've been overutilized. I was reading something that student nurses have now been sent a letter saying that they're, they're no longer needed after the pandemic. Um, left in situations of unemployment, what more needs to be done to support BAME frontline workers, essentially? Right, I think uh, that, that is very true, Angelina, but what happens is if you look at the medical profession and the nursing profession, I think it is a major problem in the nursing profession at the moment because I have heard where 
the staff were not been able to refuse when they've been asked to go and work without the proper personal protective enhanced personal protection so which was one of the main reasons but there are a lot of patients and the staff got infected because we didn't have the right system and that's again highlights the arrogance and the incompetence of the government when it came to the initial stages but if you look at the medical profession, our profession, and I came to the UK from Sri Lanka in early 90s, prior to that, there was a huge amount of racism and people couldn't advance in their career and they have to take up a job, uh, which can lead to a speciality or the consultant level. But fortunately, it is changing now. I think in my practice, if you look at it, 45% of the NHS medical, NHS doctors are from ethnic background. So the significant number of people are doing. In fact, if you look at the entry in university admissions, about 20% of the university entrants are uh, from BAME background, So, which is good. And also I am seeing in terms of the senior clinicians and the decision making, and also in the ability to be in the management, there are a lot of people from ethnic background is able to represent now a, a lot more than before. So it's looking good for, I would say, for medical professional, but for nursing profession, I think that is still a long way to go. And that's something I think they need more voice. And I think in, in our hospital, we have set up a BAME staff meeting and champions for each, each uh, profession. So that is the way forward. As I mentioned, I just mentioned this as one of the positive came out of the, the uh, pandemic because the racism being highlighted in many levels. One is the George Floyd unfortunate death and the, what is happening in the NHS with the COVID-19. So it, it is a momentum. I think it's something that we need to make sure that uh, we put it right and we try and work on that. I think it is a good time that we try and advance this particular issue. And do you think the press coverage on the issues faced by the NHS, particularly for NHS Bain workers, has been accurate? Or has it hindered? I think, so. I think, you know, I have watched a couple of Downing Street uh, in a briefing by the politicians and the scientific advisors. Uh, by and large, I think uh, the questions from the, the journalist have been pretty good and to highlight the issues. But the government have not really taken any responsibility and have not made any changes. That is one of the criticism, I think. You know, we know what is happening but they are not put into measures what is going to happen moving forward. So that is where the frustration at the moment is being talked about in the, in the BAM community, in the medical community a lot. Okay, fantastic. Does anyone have any questions? I, I, I'm happy for you to go on mute and ask if, as long as there's not two people okay, who ask at once. So who is that? Anyone? No one. No one's asking any questions. Um, you can put on the chat too if you have any other questions for Dr. Mati. Um, I'll give it a few minutes for people to a minute or two for people to think about anything they want to ask. I have some questions, Anjali, but I think what I'll do is I'll just save them to the end because it'll be good to hear from everyone. <laughs> okay. Cool. That's fine. Um, so we'll move on to um, Dr. Nero. Um, and her topic is um, mental health during the pandemic. Thanks very much, Anjali. Um, I'm trying to actually uh, share my presentation with you. Um, do you think I'll be able to do that? Um, yeah, it should work. In the bottom right hand corner, there should be something that says present now. Okay. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, all right. So I can't actually see any of you now. <laughs> so um, if there's any problems, just uh, unmute yourself and, and shout out. Uh, right. Thanks very much again for the uh, for the lovely um, introduction and also for for inviting me to come and speak to you guys. Um, so um, I was hoping to speak to you all about mindfulness, and I think um, especially with the COVID nineteen pandemic, it's it's I think it's been particularly sort of elevated as as uh, you know something that we can use in our day to day. Um, the way uh, the way I came across mindfulness was actually by accident. Um, so 
uh, I attended a GP lecture ages ago um, where uh, someone talked about sort of GP well-being and uh, burnout in GPs um, and there was lots of GPs dropping out uh, just because of the workload and stress and someone had mentioned mindfulness as something they'd done uh, and uh, so I sort of decided to look into this a bit more um, and uh, attended a few lectures to sort of find practical ways to incorporate that into my day-to-day -day. Um, and uh, yeah since then I've been trying to practice as regularly as I can it's really helped me and I hope uh, this lecture will help you too uh, and this talk will help you too with um, you know trying to find pragmatic ways of incorporating that into your day-to-day. Um, let's talk about COVID. Um, I mean, the pandemic has had a massive impact on our mental health, um, and it's not surprising why. You know, we are we are now consumed with 24-hour news. Uh, you know, just bad news really for the last three months of just death, um, care home deaths, people, young people dying, uh, people not being able to see their families, restrictions, lockdown, um, and economic a potential sort of economic uh, you know crisis that's looming. People losing their jobs. Um, and it feels like the last three, four months has just been bad news after bad news with very little relief from from this. Um, and it's really brought a lot of the mental health conditions to the fore. So people who have previously managed them at home, not needing professional help, uh, or who have who have required professional help in the past and were able to access them, have really have now found it difficult to manage it and then seek help because of the pandemic. You know, things have all been closed. There's no sort of help for us to um, help for them to um, speak to a counsellor, for example, or face to face assessments and so forth. So it's been really, really difficult. Um, so if you look at the sort of specific uh, impact on mental health, the sort of serious ones, I've just listed some of the ones that I have come across um, in, in primary care in particular. So uh, stress in particular, I mean, you'd probably all agree that the, the stress level of the nation has gone through the roof. Um, so, you know, people are living in very very high anxiety and stress levels uh, just because we're not quite sure what's going to happen next um, and quite naturally when patients ring up to tell me they're stressed I actually tell them you know what I'm stressed too um, you know <laughs> so I, I don't always have the sort of magic pill to help you know I don't have a magic pill to help you but actually I think it's, it's quite um, almost comforting to know that everybody is feeling the same way uh, and not to feel sort of particularly not to feel bad about it or not to feel guilty about the fact that you're feeling stressed because it's okay um, because it, it is a very uncertain uncertain time for all of us lots and lots of changes not quite sure what this you know what the light at the end of the tunnel is looks like so you know, understandably, people are very stressed. Anxiety, so mental health conditions like anxiety and depression have increased. So we're seeing a lot of people who have previously been able to manage these things at home uh, or with, you know, sort of talking therapies, uh, online therapies, have now resorted to sort of trying medications. Um, so that has, I've seen an increase in that personally. Um, loneliness is another one. Um, so you probably would have heard of a lot of elderly people, in particular before the pandemic, who have been very, very lonely. You know, they can go weeks without seeing anybody or speaking to anyone. And this was before the pandemic. So just imagine what sort of impact this must have had on them. Um, so we are, we are quite lucky in our surgery. We have a nursing staff who carry out welfare checks on our patients. And so we call around regularly to make sure they're OK. Uh, but not every surgery is doing that. And, you know, where does the response? Responsibility lie. Who, who's meant to do that? Who's supposed to do it? So, very, very difficult time for our elderly people. Um, I've decided to put down grief and bereavement, um, and I know some of you may have heard a lot of the NHS workers in particular would have, would know that uh, families, for example, weren't allowed to visit their relatives due to the risk of transmission. Um, it's, it's also in their last days, especially during the peak of the illness. Um, and you know, I, I personally feel really strongly about that because I had a patient who died like that, and it's caused uh, you know it, it was very very upsetting for the family. It was very upsetting for me to watch them that way, not being able to ha hug their mum because they're different households not being able to attend the funeral because there were more than five people five people and the patient dying on their own so it was a very very difficult time and you know I feel like there has been almost this right of grief um, being taken away from them uh, in this time and who knows I mean at the moment they're managing but you know these kind of things then can come back as you know unresolved grief extended grief reactions which we may see you know down the line 
post-traumatic stress, another one. Um, so I've, I think this is specifically for healthcare workers. So as a GP, although I'm frontline, we haven't been seeing very many patients, but guys that work in the hospitals, you know, they have, uh, especially those that have worked on the wards, a &E, ITU, they have seen such a high number of patients dying in front of their eyes, right in front of their eyes, with no relatives to support the patients and them being the only ones to support them. And I think, you know, again, they're coping, they're managing, but who knows what's going to loom. Um, you know, they've they've all gone in with a war mentality to fight the crisis, but we know we're not quite sure what the sort of aftermath of, of all of that really is on them. Um, so lots and lots of mental health problems um, among staff as well as uh, the general public. So let's think about ways how we can help our mental well-being. Um, so I was going to list a few, um, just you know, just things that I could think of. Uh, but actually, I asked one of my friends who's shielding herself. So she's in the uh, clinically vulnerable uh, group who has been shielding for the last three, three and a half months um, and hasn't left the house. She uh, works from home and. Although it's been business as usual for me, I've been out and about. I've been going to work, you know, uh, going, you know, go, go, you know, my daughter's going to school and so forth. Uh, but she hasn't been able to do that. So um, I asked her what kind of tips she can give for people who have been, uh, you know, who have been isolating, or how do you how do you stay positive? Um, so she gave me these ten tips, and I wondered whether you know it's something that you guys try, you can try as well. Um, so she said she wants, she definitely limited media consumption, so she wouldn't do more than thirty minutes of news. Um, it was too much. It was too much. Otherwise, too much news is not good. Um, she created a timetable to make sure she was she had a routine on a daily basis. Um, exercise was mandatory, whether that was a quick jog in the garden or whether there was a bit of Pilates or yoga at home, whatever it was, keep yourself active good for your physical health as well as your mental health. Uh, she scheduled something energizing every day. So things like a 15 minute of uninterrupted reading or a bit of guilt-free Netflix or having a cup of tea with biscuits, uh, you know, something that you look forward to during your day. Um, practice self-compassion. This is such an important one for all of us, really. It's really easy to feel guilty about the situation we find ourselves in, which is way beyond our control. Um, and it's really time to think, you know, it's okay to feel this way. Everybody is feeling this way um, and show, your, show yourself some love really um stay connected to your friends uh, ideally by phone she said she was getting a bit of zoom fatigue <laughs> so um you know she was talking to a lot of her friends sort of on whatsapp um create rhythms to the week it's easy for monday to friday sort of all blend in. well monday to sunday now really to all blend in and you know remember the days when we used to look forward to a saturday or sunday and thank god it was a friday but well, now we don't really get that feeling anymore so she decided to get you know have specific days where she had specific things to do so on a thursday it would be a date night on a Saturday it would be pan pancake day and on a Sunday it would be church day so it was these things that she incorporated to get a bit of rhythm into her day uh, gardening she found really really helpful so if you guys are going to gardening you know it's quite a nurturing experience um, you know it's, it's quite sort of a loving experience a tendering experience so that's something people can try um, setting mini objectives so every week she would have a goal um, like learning 10 Spanish words or learning 10 French words or whatever uh, and it's a sense of achievement isn't it when you achieve those sort of mini objectives on a, on a weekly basis and journaling. So um, I know it's not for everybody, but writing thoughts down and being able to see them, uh, you know, being able to read your thoughts out loud can sometimes be really helpful. Right. Okay. Well, I, I thought... uh, sorry, it's Nishma. I'm yeah. so sorry to interrupt, but your slides are not moving. I think we're just seeing the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, ah. Open. Yeah. So I don't know if you need to change. Um, we're not seeing the presentation. Oh, right. We're just seeing the the document that you would have probably been editing. So it's still on the first page. All oh, right. Sorry, okay. So, yeah. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Okay. So let's. So I may. I don't know how to change it in that case. I may have to just go back and forth in that case. Uh, all right. Okay. Let's do some exercise. Can you see my screen now? Can you see that slide? Okay, yeah, great. Perfect. Okay, all right. Okay, so um, don't worry. This is not um, this is not a physical exercise, but um, I was just trying to see if we can uh, get you guys to do a bit of a mental exercise, as it were. So um, I'll be grateful if you guys could maybe just um, you know sit in a quiet room. Many of you probably are already. Uh, maybe try and sit down, and I'm just going to get you to sort of try and focus your attention on your breathing. So I'm going to guide you through an exercise, uh, you know, on, on on your breathing. Okay, so if you're all ready. So let me start. Uh, to prepare for this exercise, find yourself a comfortable position. You may choose to close your eyes or lower your gaze. Allow yourself to relax. Allow your whole body to relax. Begin by gently moving your attention to the process of breathing. 
simply observing each breath as it happens. Whether that's focusing on the rise and fall of your chest or abdomen, or perhaps the sensation of the breath as it begins to change or stay at a steady pace. Allow your in-breath to become deeper and deeper and your out-breath become longer and longer. As you engage with this exercise, you may find your mind wanders, caught by thoughts or noises around the room. When you notice this happens, know that it's okay and our mind often wanders. Simply notice that it's caught your mind's attention and bring your focus gently back to your breaths. Allow your breath to bring a sense of stillness and a feeling of calm to the right here and right now. You may find a feeling of inner peace, a feeling of warmth and a balance. Of, and a balance. Slowly when you're ready and comfortable to do so, expand your awareness and you, when you feel ready, you can start opening your eyes and bring the exercise to a close. Right, I can't actually see any of you, so I'm just going to assume you guys took part. <laughs> um, right, so what did we do there? So this is, um, you know, a little bit of mindfulness is one way of doing it. So essentially what I was trying to do is to um, get you guys to focus on your breathing, um, trying to bring your mind to the present moment. Um, and you may have found your mind is wandering and half the time people's mind always wanders, but that's fine. It's about acknowledging that and bring it right back to the present moment. Um, and so many times we think about what's happened in the past, something that we can't really change. And what's about happened in the future, something that we can't really change. So actually the ability to stay in the present and try to focus on the present is, is a great sort of emotional intelligence that we can develop by doing mindfulness practice. So the definition, the official definition uh, is uh, a mental state that's achieved by concentrating on the present moment while calmly accepting the feelings and thoughts that come to you used as a technique to help you relax. There are different ways of practicing. So focus on your breathing, body scan, five senses, lots of different ways, a, a lot of different ways. But one of the best ways is probably to sort of be guided by your breathing um, because it allows you to sort of relax um, and um, it's probably one of the easier ways of starting off mindfulness. Um, there's a lot of neuroscientific evidence. So people who have done um, uh, brain imaging on people who have, who have practiced mindfulness meditation and those who haven't. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence to say these pe people who have practiced mindfulness quite regularly uh, have a, what we call a higher emotional intelligence. So the ability to respond to stimuli slightly differently. So being able to be in control of, of, of their reactions uh, in, in, a, in, in a much um, more, much more stronger way. Um, so, um, so it's something that, you know, I think in time, as you, as you practice it and as your focus increases and improves, um, this is something that, uh, you know, you might be able to achieve too. So how has it helped me? Well, it's far, especially at work, I think, um, you know, a feeling of control, the ability to respond more rationally in stressful situations uh, and reduce stress has been a big sort of plus point for me. Um, work can be very, very stressful. Even the other day I was on call and, um, you know, I had lots of paperwork piling up, lots and lots of requests all coming through in one go. And it's easy to feel very overwhelmed when that happens. So, um, you know, just be able to snap out of that for a couple of minutes or so and just to say to yourself, you know, time out here. I just want to take a deep breath in um, and trying to focus on the present moment um, is it stops you from your mind running sort of uncontrollably almost and sort of grasping that straight, you know, nip it in the bud. Um, so I think that's why I find it really, really helpful when when I find myself in those sort of situations. Um, and I find it personally, because I, I practice it, I'm able to tell my patients about it as well and how beneficial it is for them. How can I help you? So um, in general, so we know people who practice this quite regularly find that they have an improved sort of mental well-being. So self-awareness, resilience, focus, attention, um, mental clarity. And especially if you're in very sort of high demand jobs where your brain is constantly you know, working, working, working. It's about preventing burnout, really. Um, by having this increased self-awareness. Um, and I understand that it's not for everyone. 
but it's another tool to have in your toolbox you know it's another thing that you can use in case you know you need it um there are great resources available if you look for mindfulness um and uh, the nhs ones i've stated here are free so i'm happy to send them over to angie and she can disseminate it amongst the group um headspace and feeling good so these are uh, apple apps apple iphone apps i'm sure they're available on android as well uh, and some of the mindfulness websites here that i've stated i think you have to pay for one of them um, but most of them have lots of good resources that you can you know try at home so um give it a go and I think the key thing here really is to look after yourselves. So don't let the pandemic get on top of you. Um, practice these techniques, um, stay calm. It's okay to feel this way. Everyone is in the same boat uh, and you know, we'll all get through it together. Um, and before I uh, leave you, um, I just wanted to show you some of the funniest memes I came across of COVID. Um, you know, I just thought, you know, let's end on a high, as it were. So um, the Sriracha hand, hand, hand sanitizer, I mean, you know, <laughs> why didn't I think of that? Um, you know, it's a good one. So it just stops you from touching your eyes, face and other places a second time, that's for sure. Um, don't come back to, don't ever go to 2020. Yeah, good one. You know, 2021 will be our year. And who could forget Trump's bleach comment? So um, thank you very much for listening um, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions if you have. I shall stop sharing my screen now. That was super useful, uh, Dr. Nero. It's always good to be reminded of, of the benefits of mindfulness. Um, thank you. It's, um, does, does anyone have any specific questions that they can put on the chat um, for Dr. Nero? Um. Oh. um hi it's nishma i had a question um right. if i can ask so it's oh. it's um yeah so i guess what i've been wondering is that um because a friend of mine came over the other day with her baby who was born right at the beginning of um the lockdown and so it made us think we were just jokingly talking about oh what kind of impact will this way of living have on this kid right when she grows up and like what how will she be socialized and all that so in that context i was thinking about what what do you think that do you think there will be longer term impacts of the lockdown and the way that we're living on our mental health and um i guess if do you have any idea of the kinds of things that might be or um what we can keep a lookout or maybe things we can be doing um or just generally your thoughts on that, because I just thought it was really interesting when I was talking to a friend of mine about it the other day that it's obviously going to have an impact, but it's hard to tell and hard to know um, what that will be, really. Yeah, absolutely. I think people who've had babies or who people who are pregnant in particular are slightly in a bit of an odd position, aren't they? Uh, as you know, usually when you've had a baby, the first thing you want to do, invite everybody over, fun time, you know, baby needs to socialise. Now they're not even allowed to see their grandparents. So it is a very, very odd time for them. And, um, you know, I mean, hopefully your, your friend's daughter, you know, your friend's baby is well and healthy and so forth. So that's the key thing. But you're right. I think, you know, we can never underestimate the sort of mental impact this will have on people, whether it's on mothers, who uh, can't socialize who can't go to those baby groups anymore uh, and I think there'll be a constant fear in people um, to really go to these places so um, unless you know really things go back to almost a normal life I think this this sort of impact will, will this will this stress I think will stay on people's mind for a very long time to come um, you know we've been conditioned to think think that way and quite rightly so I mean this this virus hasn't gone away so we, we can't take any chances we can't relax we can't sit back um, but in mothers in particular I would be concerned about things like post-traumatic stress disorder you know depression in, in it's been a post postnatal depression sorry uh, postnatal depression in women who've had babies um, and um, I think that you know you know that's that those are the kind of things I've been more concerned about so um, I, you know I think you're right I think the impact is probably remains to be seen but you know I think I think it will have a massive impact on people and it will change people's lives forever thank you thank you does anyone um, else have any further questions if not I think we'll move on to um, Yasmin um, who is going to speak about the future of the NHS so Yasmin I'll leave it to you thank you Hi guys, um, hello to everyone listening. My name is Yasmin. I am a graduate pharmacist um, working in community pharmacy and also in a hospital. 
um, on wards and in the dispensary. My take on this is going to be um, a lot different to my fellow guest speakers. I have considerably less experience than them. Um, they are very esteemed as well. And I think my take on things will be a lot more informal as well um, because I have been working such a short period of time. But also my career has started with COVID, if that makes sense. So I've been you know, really, really recently working. Um, so this sort of shapes my whole future in a sense. So I, I didn't really see the shift in um, healthcare from before to after. I was only working a few months um, when COVID first you know, the first cases happened here. Um, but I hope, hopefully, some people can gain something from my insight. Um, so like Anjali said, I will be talking about the future of the NHS and of NHS professionals. Um, initially, I was going to focus it on um, ethnic minorities and their take on things, but I think it's applicable to everyone um, right now, especially. What I think what the main thing is, is that the I don't know if there will be a significant change because of COVID, but I think the pressures that are arising because of um, the, the lack of, for example, the lack of PPE and the um, all the protests going on right now, um, which are justified, all of those are bringing up into light um, things like, you know, a lot of BAME people aren't in higher positions, especially when you look at it from a pharmacy side. Um, there's a lot of things going on on social media um, regarding this. A lot of people on Twitter are quite, you know, um, outspoken on these topics. But it seems to be that only the BAME, the people from BAME backgrounds are really focused on this. And the people that are not from those backgrounds sort of leave it to BAME Twitter, if that makes sense, or BAME Facebook and those kinds of groups. Um, what, I, what I think the NHS, uh, the future of the NHS will be like is it will be shaped if everyone starts to listen. And by everyone, I mean all of, also people from all sorts of backgrounds, not just ethnic minorities. Because as you can see here, quite a few people have joined. People are passionate, but we're ma mainly from like ethnic minorities. It's not other people joining in on these kinds of calls. For them to hear our perspective on it, I think it's very important because we're not sort of just fighting and arguing to have you know a higher job a higher ranking position um if if we can get one it's because we have experience we need people like that we know what patients might need if that makes sense um that's how the future of the nhs can be shaped from that perspective but i think what covid has brought into light right now as well is mainly the lack of um coming through with your actions which i think dr matty touched on um the lack of of actually coming through rather than just saying something. So the NHS have said that they will provide PPE to pharmacists, to hospital workers um, in sufficient amounts. But this varies from my perspective. You know, I've seen it in community. We only received maybe one box at the very start of COVID of gloves, aprons and masks. Everything else my, my company had to independently source. Um, and I was very lucky that my company was able to source these and also pay for them. Um, it, this varies from community pharmacy to community pharmacy. But I also had the opportunity of working in hospital, which I'm, I'm based at now. Um, and there are variances in the uh, PPE available based on trust as well. So I work in a, um, in a large trust in central London. Um, we're very, uh, very lucky to have masks on every single ward in the pharmacy in the clinical offices um, it's now compulsory to wear the masks on the wards um, or whenever you're in the hospital there are also aprons widely available and gloves um, but speaking to my colleagues um, and also fellow graduate pharmacists and pharmacists working in different trusts um, and I'm, I'm not sure if the other doctors here um, working in different trusts can agree um, but this isn't available for everyone so it's not sort of a luxury that we have at our hands, um, you know, PPE is not readily available like the government is making it out to be. Um, this, this varies from trust to trust um, across the UK and also from different sectors. So community pharmacy is not something that is, you know, they don't have lots of PPE readily available like it's being made out to be. This, I think, needs to be something tackled in the future um, I think the main thing is the, the 
response to the time it takes for the, act the government to actually go forward and do something about things. They've said that they will provide PPE, they've said that they will fund um, so-and-so, but not, none of it has actually come through, unfortunately. Um, I think that's, that's how the future of the NHS should change. Um, but in terms of another topic that I've been asked to talk about, um, which is fake medicines, I have uh, not encountered any fake medicines as of yet during the COVID period. Um, fake medicines could be um, something, you know, made not in a, in a laboratory, um, being sold to make money um, for independent companies or businesses. Uh, we have not, I, I was speaking to my colleagues as well, um, my pharmacist colleagues, they have not encountered anything like that. Um, but I think what the COVID situation shone a light on was independent companies trying to exploit the, the situation and sell um, other items that the the media was making um, you know apparent that you might need for COVID. So, for example, hand gels, face masks, soaps. Um, there are a lot of companies uh, coming into pharmacy and community pharmacies um, offering to sell them independently. Soap, hand gels, um, anti-back, a lot of different things. Um, and obviously, being contracted with the NHS, pharmacies can't just um, provide these for their patients. So a lot of businesses have been exploiting um, the COVID situation and making money off of it at the expense of patients because obviously these products aren't tested properly and the efficacy is not tested, so we don't know if it actually works for patients. Um, but I think what's important and what's interesting actually is the use of media and how it shifted um, the treatments or the medicines or recommendations for patients. Um, for example, working in community pharmacy, just really informally, um, I would have never imagined paracetamol to sell out or ibuprofen, you know, really, really common things that if you told me a year ago, this would sell out in a year's time, I'd be like, okay, just, just don't go there. Um, but it actually did. It was very difficult sourcing, you know, these really basic medications. Um, and then it sort of shifted based on what the media was recommending. So the media began to recommend something called hydroxychloroquine, um, which is a medication that patients do need. Um, with different conditions, but people would be coming in and requesting it um, and saying that they have, you know, private prescriptions, not NHS prescriptions that they've just phoned a doctor for um, and seeing if we have any in stock. And obviously that puts a, a knock-on effect onto our suppliers and our supply chain of the medication um, from a pharmacy perspective. Because if we're sort of sourcing all of the, the medications nationwide, then the patients that actually do need it um, won't be able to receive it in a week's time, and a month's time, um, which puts a strain on the GPs who have to prescribe it, on the doctors that have to prescribe the medication as well, um, and we'll have to find alternatives for them. And the same is happening now with um, dexamethasone. It's quite uh, known in the media now um, as a treatment for COVID, um, but obviously these recommendations come from um, maybe one source of evidence and as as healthcare professionals we have to use many multiple sources of evidence and be sort of sure what we're recommending to our patients will actually work for them um, so I don't know from my perspective I think the media really plays a part in the shift of healthcare and the future of the NHS um, because you have really positive things coming out like people recognizing how important the NHS is by clapping for the NHS and all of that sort of stuff um, but at the same time really really quickly things can sort of go downhill by maybe one or two people recommending certain treatments um, and then everyone jumping on that bandwagon so I don't know from my perspective I, I found those points interesting and the the use of media very interesting um, but I just I don't know exactly how it will go um, thank you, Yasmin. That was really insightful. Um, just just uh, a, a couple of questions on what you've spoken about today. Um, so the clap for carers, did you did you think it was a gimmick or did you actually appreciate it? Um, um, yeah, it's, an, it's a very interesting one. I feel like, um, obviously, I don't know what everyone's intentions are. 
Um, but in, in my area, for example, or in my local, in, in the community pharmacy that I was working at, the surrounding area is largely Bengali. So it's a large Beng Bangladeshi uh, community. Um, and our patients are very regular patients that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we form good relationships with them. And it was sort of a point of trying to, trying to educate your patients based on how they will best benefit from it. So if I, I'm sure if you're in Norfolk, for example, you have a very different patient population. Um, people might be of a different education, um, it might be easier to communicate with. Whereas in, in the pharmacy that I was working at, it was trying to tailor the information to them. So I, I don't know if they would have taken part in the Clap for Carers sort of. Um, right. Yeah. But it was um, a, a lot of them would come in and sort of thank us for remaining open um, throughout the COVID period, for still being there, for still trying to provide their medications for them and still caring for them. Because um, I think it's, it's an amazing thing that, you know, a lot of virtual clinics came about because of um, this situation. Uh, it will definitely change the way um, the NHS can, can run and function in the future. But from a pharmacy perspective, we still had patients coming in with you know, really, really simple um, minor ailments that needed still needed treatment. Um, and the same is happening in hospitals. So we're sort of seeing less um, patients coming in for quite serious conditions. So strokes, heart attacks, a lot of the common conditions that you'd see on maybe in A&E or on the admissions ward or on different wards in hospital, you're seeing a lot less of. Um, so you're sort of thinking, what's what's going on? Is the is the numbers decreasing or are patients not coming in because of a reason? So what we were trying to do was trying to communicate to our patients um, in a really simple term in, in community pharmacy um, and explain to them, you know, if you have these symptoms, then try not to come in. Trying to uh, get our fellow colleagues that actually speak the same language as the patients to communicate this as well. Um, so yeah, Angela, I don't know if they if the patients were <laughs> part in the clap for carers or if they would have appreciated it or even understood what it, it was for. Um, but a lot of majority of patients appreciate the healthcare workers. Um, they're vocal about it, um, and even if they're not vocal, they're sort of. I, I think they I think they do appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I think uh, some um, of the comments asked a question could you shed some light on how pharmacists could help with issues within our communities like fake remedies circulated on whatsapp um i don't know about you guys but even my mom gets these really random <laughs> whatsapp messages um recommending something i think today my mom received a message recommending selenium um so tablets so something really obscure really out there if you take one tablet three times a day you're going to be protected against corona um i think a good takeaway message maybe from this call um or i'm pretty sure most of us on here would have seen a message like this or have a parent that might have received a message like this or a family member i think educate your your family and yourselves to not sort of jump on a bandwagon like the media is teaching us to do um it, that's dangerous we don't we don't have you know we have all the right stuff in the NHS to give us advice. Um, your GPs are still available, local pharmacists are still available. You can give anyone a call if you don't even need to pop out, like you don't need to go out of your house to do so. Um, ask for advice, ask, so educate your family members to ask for advice or help them to seek the advice um, if they genuinely have an, a question, not to just sort of believe um, or, or not seek help because I think it's, it's more detrimental for us to sort of leave things as they are and you know leave like yeah mom you can you can go and take I don't know dexamethasone for COVID it will it will treat you if you leave that sort of mentality to continue running it's only going to go downhill from here I think. Thank you um, I think we've got a question for all three all three speakers on there from Habiba um, What's everyone's thoughts on the government scrapping of the student nurse contracts whilst they were mass whilst, whilst they massively spent on how they fa the failed the now trail sorry blah, 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 whilst they uh, whilst they so I think the question is is um, what what's everyone's thoughts on the government scrapping of student nurse nurse contracts whilst um, 
there was a massive spend on track and trace which has now failed and that's probably money down the drain too i mean um from my oh, from my perspective i i don't know i don't know how beneficial the track and trace would have been obviously none of us really benefited from that um student nurses or any any trainee graduate student um is still part of the nhs infrastructure um and it's sort of a you know a, a disappointment that the government had taken that approach um i in my perspective i think everything that happened here in the uk was very delayed the response to the, to the whole situation was very delayed um, in comparison with a lot of other countries um that might be the reason why our numbers were were so high and still remain very very high um but i think it's interesting to hear the uh, other doctors um perspective on this yeah i think uh, if you look at actually the the number of nurses we have in this country it is a lot less compared to some of the other western countries so on chart we know that um, so the reasons that we don't have enough nursing staff or doctors is that uh, the working conditions, the hours, and how they looked after in the NHS is very poor. For example, lots of uh, nursing staff happen to be female and their family, and they need to be more flexible. So as a result, they find it difficult to continue the job and also after a young family, which can be quite challenging and stressful. So instead of supporting the people who want to take up nursing and what the government is doing is, is just the opposite. So this is where what they say, it doesn't happen when it's in action. So it is a huge discrepancy in the way that the government is saying that we have. But in the past, uh, I, I think it's been said that the nursing students were paid during their first few years, but that also they abolished recently. So coming back to this uh, contact tracing and track and trace system, uh, which again, you would have seen that again, the arrogance and the incompetence of government, you know, they are not got it right. There are other countries that they're already up and running. And we've been talking about this for months now. Uh, as Jasmine quite rightly mentioned, we were really delayed in getting the implementation at each and every level. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't have proper PPE for months and that as a result, a lot of people got infected. And then we didn't we didn't actually put the lockdown two weeks in beforehand. That has been accepted by a lot of people. I'm sure there'll be a huge inquiry once this is all under control and this all will come to light. I think another the track and trace is an important part to say, or to prevent second wave, that is going to be the next big step and we are not there yet. So that problem, I know that they are spending a lot of money, uh, but it is unfortunate. This is the thing, people need to be honest and transparent. Sometimes we don't get it right, but an easy thing, technology, as you said, initially, it can go wrong. But the, the obvious thing is to accept it and work with people rather than trying to say, look, we have got the one of the best system. That is what they keep in comment. They say, we have got one of the best system everywhere. But in fact, to be honest, I haven't seen any best system them, uh, in a lot of other countries with less wealth and with less uh, intervention, they are doing a lot better. Uh, I think uh, it, it's very true. Uh, it's, very, it's frustrating for people who like us on front line when these things happening. Uh, we are now Dr. very strongly Henry. about the community. Yeah, no, I totally echo what the other speakers have said. I think the government has, in many ways, had a very sort of incompetent, delayed reaction to the crisis from the beginning onwards, initially downplaying the whole crisis, then to suddenly going into lockdown. Now we're starting to open up as if, you know, we're sort of, uh, we have almost, you know, have no infection in the country. Uh, and the track and trace system should have been up and running completely before they opened up, because that was the only way of stopping the spread of this virus. Now they haven't got the app working, they haven't got the contact tracers able to trace two thirds of the positive coronavirus patients. So 
I'm honestly a bit worried about how they're playing this. Um, you know, so I, I, yes, I, I, I agree with with uh, Dr. Mali there that other countries have managed to work this out. And they, Singapore, for example, was one of the first countries to get really good contact tracing into place, uh, really sourcing out exactly where the where the contact has been, who who they've been in touch with. And I think Germany's actually got a contact um, sort of a track and trace app going. Uh, it's already uh, up and running. So why the UK has had one of the highest number of deaths in the world plus not being able to get a track and trace uh, system in place uh, is is actually gobsmacking it's it's you know it's, it's very very disappointing on our behalf of the government interesting points um i think nishma you had a few questions for the speakers um yeah what i i'll do i'll share other people's questions first um that I, we might have missed in the chat so habiba had asked earlier um, primarily, primarily for Dr. Mathi, but I think anyone can sort of pitch in and answer. So, um, thank you for your presentation. She said, and um, she wanted uh, your comments on the Bain report that was published a couple of weeks ago, and what you made of it, and what strategies you think the government should be implementing in light of that report. Um, so, um, yeah, any of the speakers, I think, would, whoever wants to input, would, would love to hear from you. But I'm sure Anir will have some points. But what uh, my understanding, when the report came, we all knew there were issues that the BAME doctors or the staff, the nursing staff uh, in the NHS were not given the right protection. And for example, when, as you said, we didn't have enough enhanced PPE, uh, the people who said, look, it's OK, there's no risk, there's no evidence, the science is not there. You can go. Whereas they knew, we knew that wasn't the case. So that's one point. How we can move forward is first acknowledging there is a problem that we need to make sure that the BAM staff needs. If they want, for example, one of the trust in Somerset I saw a couple of months ago, they said if BAM staff wanted to use enhanced PPE for any patient they're seeing, they were happy to provide it. I think that is a quite a good way forward so that you're providing that reassurance that you know we have got you know we are concerned what's going on one of the other thing i mentioned for the angel angelis question that in terms of uh, medical representation is getting better whereas for the nursing we need to have champions for the bam group in each in individual uh, you know people who work as a healthcare assistant who will work in the 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 people who work in the the cleaning department domestic department there are a lot of bam staff there so their voice need to be heard, and that only can be done. But if we have representation in the NHS managerial level, if you look at for, just for doctors, forty-five percent of the NHS doctors are BAME background now. If you look at the managers, it's only five percent. So the senior decision making is still happening in within. So there's no proportionate representation. So that is thing that every trust, every organisation need to put in place. There should be good representation of the BAM background at all levels. So that they will be empowered, they will be able to make those changes, they will be able to try and understand you know, what's going on. And that is where I feel, uh, I remember you know, looking in the initial stages where when the BAM staff was asked to go and work in a COVID patient's group of ward, they couldn't say no. The local was able to say no because they know how to get around that problem, but these people the idea that they were have that, uh, you know, the right to say no. So those are the, some of the things we need to highlight, perhaps education, improvement, and this is an opportunity. As I mentioned, this is one of the positive things that we can work on this to try and improve overall representation in future. Dr. Neera, do you have any comments to add? No, uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, I agree with Dr. Madi there. So that, you know, BAME staff are very much over represented in the sort of frontline staff and, and the number of deaths, but very under underrepresented in sort of managerial positions and all the decisions are made at a managerial level. So I guess it's not particularly representative of what's required for BAME staff. Um, I guess in hospitals, because of the sort of layers of management that you have, 
changes like that are very, very difficult to make. But from sort of experience in general practice, um, you know, we have had this um, sort of an informal tool called the SARD score. I don't know if um, the other doctors have, have been aware of this, but essentially where every member of staff in a general practice has been risk assessed based on their ethnicity. Um, so if, if, you have, if you are of Indian heritage, you score one. If you're Afro-Caribbean heritage, you score four. So it's sort of an in, informal sort of unvalidated score that's been brought out because of this increased number of BAME staff health professional death that we have been seeing. And general practice is taking a stance. You know, we, we can't see our frontline staff, you know, you know, essentially getting COVID and dying of COVID. So we need to take the necessary precautions. So people who are at this higher risk level are basically not allowed to see patients. So they can't go, come to reception. They can't, they can't sit in reception to see patients. They have to sit in individual rooms. They get PPE to wear. So all of those sort of safety mechanisms where I work, especially, uh, has all been put in uh, to ensure our staff are safe. So, uh, you know, I just wish hospitals would take a stronger stance, um, you know, to protect our BAME staff members uh, who, who you know, work frontline, who are your nursing staff, your HCAs, uh, people, you know, who, who are, you know, caring for patients around the clock. Um, so, you know, I, I guess, you know, because the government hasn't permitted in the report, uh, that's why these larger organizations feel like they can get away with it, really. Yasmin, did you have anything to add? No, you're on mute. Yasmin, you're on mute. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> I said very, very valid points um, from both doctors. And with uh, what Dr. Nero said about the um, risk uh, risk assessment, I think the same thing has been done in, um, at least at my trust, um, they are assessing all BAME, um, people from BAME backgrounds uh, for their risk um, and then seeing, they sort of have like a flow chart of what to do um, if someone is at risk or if someone's uncomfortable um, with continuing to work. Uh, so I think, yeah, still more could be done there. Okay, fantastic. Um, were there any other questions in the chat which which had gone amiss? I don't think so. No, I don't I don't think so. I didn't um, if anybody has please just no. flag to me. Um one of the questions I had, I mean, if there are any more questions, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself or pop it in the chat. But in the meantime, um a question that I had was um Yasmin, I thought you made a really, really good point that. Um, around companies that are exploiting the situation and overcharging for things like face masks. So I saw <clears throat> I saw face masks the other day going for like twenty pounds each and things like that. And obviously, I don't. I'm sure everyone or a lot of us have seen these kind of designer face masks and things going out as well. Um, and just in conversation with um, friends and colleagues, um, there's kind of been this idea that oh well, it's just economic supply and demand. It happens with everything. But do you feel that businesses have a duty to also be working? like Dr. Matthew said, in a wartime context, like this is a phrase that's been used for, for frontline workers across the board to say, you know, just pitch in, let's everyone all do what we need to do. But why is nobody saying that about corporate businesses that are profiting off some of these things, right? And should government, do you think government should be capping prices on these kinds of things or intervening in these situations? Because I don't see why certain industries or groups of people should be acting as if we're in wartime and, you know, just pitching in and doing the best they can whereas others can kind of go ahead and do whatever they want. So, I mean, it's a part question, part thought. No, no, I definitely agree. Um, the same, the, the exact same discussion we're having, at least from a community um, pharmacy perspective, we, so the way community pharmacy works, um, so the pharmacy on your high street or, um, or in your area, is that we are part contracted with the NHS, but it's also a business. Um, so when we receive, for example, face masks from suppliers, um, we receive them at sort of a, uh, a price and then we set a trade price as well. So something we're going to sell it at. Um, the, the key point is to not overprice things because a, fa a face mask shouldn't be something, you know, one face mask for £20 when, you know, it's now compulsory to go out onto um, transport, public transport and wear a face mask. Um, it, it's exploitation. It's not sort of making money. It's definitely exploitation. Um, what... I think I don't know the ways you can go about it. I don't know if the government can cap these kinds of things. Um, for example, there are companies on Amazon, I think, um, selling from face masks. But how effective are these face masks? Do they actually, you know, filter out the particles that could, you know, enter your um, mouth? How effective are the hand gels that companies are selling? 
um, do they actually work? Um, it's just it's just a really difficult situation. But I think there's a lack or there's a gap between um, managing or sort of controlling the stock and the business side um, and the government. I don't know what sort of input they want to have on businesses because it's sort of if they become involved in these kinds of things, they have to get involved in all sorts of trade. Um, but def definitely, if I think there are um, trading uh, groups that you can report companies to if you're seeing them sell, you know, really expensive face masks or sort of unreasonable prices um, for anything. So I, I would say definitely the public needs to um, be involved in this. It's just really unfortunate that people are making money from this situation. Thank you. Thanks. Um, did anyone else have any further questions? No. Um, just one question which um, I'd like to ask all of you. Um, so how have your families reacted to the increased danger of you working on the front line? And how have they supported you? Anyone can go first. Um, I'm happy to go first. Um, so, yeah, so actually, um, uh, my family generally is very at high risk in that perspective because uh, my husband actually works in the hospital. Uh, he's a frontline member of staff in the hospital. He's uh, one of the doctors there. I work in a GP surgery and my child has been going to nursery. <laughs> so we, we, we are high risk uh, in every way. Um, but, uh, you know, you know, we've got a job to do, you know, so I guess that's how we saw it. So, um, yeah, so, you know, we didn't have any hesitations or never thought twice about it, to be fair. What we did think is that we had to make sure that we protected uh, our family members, so, you know, our parents or our siblings and so forth. So we made sure that we were isolating ourselves from them. Um, and so my daughter hasn't been, you know, usually get childcare from my parents, which she hasn't had for the last three and a half, four months, um, which has been difficult in terms of my day-to-day -day work because I've relied on them previously to, you know, give me childcare. Um, but the nurseries have been great, so we've been able to get her into the nursery. But um you know th that has been the most difficult thing but from a sort of day-to-day -day, you know working perspective it's just been business as usual you have to go to work you have to <laughs> you have to you know it's, it's that's what we signed up for really isn't it yeah yeah i want to add to to that what Janil was saying the covid has like yeah we had a lot of uh bad things happen and it's we lost a lot of people and all that i'm a doctor i'm a doctor working in urgent care center so i also i have high risk my parents are very old so i had a a lot of battles to start with with this PPE. Uh, the urgent care center, they were like, it's all resource driven, isn't it? So they totally like uh, underplayed and they said, no, it is, uh, you have to, initially they, they were not allowed us to wear even the normal surgical mask, right? So I was told off on several occasions, you can't wear a mask in the communal area, you can't wear the mask when in the clinical stuff. So it was like a lot of battle. Finally, I decided, okay, I'm not going to work and I canceled my shift for two months. I was working in the GP surgery, but uh, urgent care center, I just canceled. And a lot of money lost that um, because part of a uh, big chunk of money coming from urgent care center work. So, but I thought, okay, I stopped for two months. I enjoy my life. Really, really, it has given a different perspective to my life. Because since we left our country, we've been running a marathon in this country to educate the children and to do this to meet the ends and all that. So I never stop. But this COVID has given me sit and think. Right. So I did my garden. I was a full time gardener. Every day I put my kids and go and I, I got very dark and I, I replenished my vitamin D. Uh, that is one and I was able to enjoy with my daughter it was always very missionary life like she goes to he's an A-level student and her exams were cancelled it was like it came like out of shock that she couldn't sit her A-level exam so she was also very low in her mood how what is the prediction going to be and all that so we cooked so we we were like do, we had a mom and daughter bonding time so this is the first time I was able to spend the time that two months I cancelled my shifts 
So we did a lot of kitchen uh, cooking and a lot of chatting, going out and shopping. My husband was like a houseman that he, he the shopping and everything that he couldn't do, he hired us. So we did the shopping and all that. And it was a completely a different perspective. I was like double busy because I have parents to do the shopping and all that. So it has given, again, you can see Dr. Mati, that I think Shanika did a hair, uh, haircut to, to him yesterday. How smart that he is. To, because the people, a lot of people are going to go jobless because that is a lot of huge potential what we have. It came to light uh, due to this COVID. We, we have the barber skills, we have the cooking skills, we have the garden skills, and we have a lot of... So that is the good uh, aspect of uh, COVID, uh, this uh, lockdown. I was reading uh, in a WhatsApp message and it was some people uh, like, uh, after, like after 50 years, if you ask a child, what is this COVID? And he was writing an essay that it was a celebration. Mom, dad all stayed at home and they spent a lot of time with us. But only thing is everybody wore a mask. We don't know why, but other than that, that we enjoy. That is one aspect. The second one is a lot of flows of our, of our wider system exposed. You know that during the initial period, like uh, we had a chat group with the, with the local back home, Sri Lanka, and the way Sri Lanka given the, the frontline workers, how they protected. And we, I was fighting even to wear a surgical mask in urgent care center work, but the colleagues of ours, those who were working in the same setup in Sri Lanka, they were given full PPE, like, and I was shocked and they handled it so well compared to us. So it was like, we had like a lot of sticks before, like CQC, um, appraisal, revalidation, and a lot of managers walking around and a lot of tick box. And we were like, you know, that we were heavily monitored. But this COVID has exposed like where we are when we compare when something like a major thing comes that it is like we couldn't handle. And we had like, we, we lost our lot of colleagues and close friends we lost. But anyway, but this is a milestone we need to concentrate. And the COVID has shown how vulnerable our community is. We've been like doing a lot of things to improve our wealth, but like we are so vulnerable, the diabetes, high blood pressure, everything that it is like our community, isn't it? So we need to take it as we sit and think and how to improve and invest in our health. Our community, the BAME community has to invest in us rather than just run around and run behind the wealth, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Really interesting. Um, and I hope that your garden, it's a shame that we can't see your garden yeah, in the background. I can see. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, did um, Yasmin or Dr. Mathi have any comments in respect to um, the question which I put in terms of how your family has dealt with with you being on the front line? Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, just to also add that Sangi, Shani's haircut, that's what I have got more gray hair than I should have. So I just blame it on her. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we both, uh, my wife and I, both are frontline doctors. Uh, we have a situation because our son needed to be shielded. So we had a, a difficult decision. But as often, you know, you don't want to shy away from your responsibility. Um, so there was no question of that we both not working, uh, but we were trying to see how best we can do our job uh, at the same time to make sure that uh, we will protect. So we both decided uh, to, you know, I had to stay away from home for, in fact, even now, it's a plan to come back uh, in a couple of weeks time home. So I was working, uh, staying in a different place. Um, but. It's one of those things, uh, Anjali, because in our hospitals, there are colleagues who have taken advantage, even with the minor situation, didn't want to come to work. There are people, if you look at the way the COVID-19, it's mainly the physicians or the medical people who are involved. There are surgeons, there are other people who didn't have any job because the hospitals were mainly admitting and looking after. So. I have to say about 90% of our non-medical colleagues didn't want to know about what's going on. Whereas that's not true in other hospitals, there are other people. So I think it is individual, you know, what is you being trained and how well that you feel strongly about your job. 
Um, so I think uh, that is perhaps the enthusiasm and the, the, the training ingrained in our system. I'm pleased to say that uh, both Ranjani and I, we were trained in the same uh, medical college. And uh, the colleagues we worked with, the colleagues, the teachers, they always are very dedicated and very much committed to their job. And in, I remember one of my uh, lecturer was telling that when someone come for your help as a doctor, you are not there to look at your time. You are not there to look at what you are doing. It is important that you need to make sure that you provide the care that the patient or the particular person needs. So it's, uh, yeah, you know, I never uh, thought about not working, uh, but I was worried because as you can see, I am in a high risk group because I am BAME and also I am a lot older than you all. So is it put me and <laughs> my risk factors goes up. Uh, but, you know, so far, you know, I, what I need is a bit of, uh, you know, hope and then hopefully with a bit of prayers, uh, all should be okay. Can't wait to make sure that things all be under control. That's really nice to hear. And fingers crossed for the next couple of weeks, next the future. Hopefully a vaccine will come out soon. So, Yasmin, this is like, from what you said, this is your first time in community pharmacy what were your parents thinking when you first went out because they knew that COVID was out there and but you had to do your job what, what did they think yeah so i it was a very very difficult um it was difficult trying to get them to understand that yes we have the precautions in place um we can't close the pharmacy down just because you know it's, it's dangerous for us to go out to work um in practice what you actually see is you know, patients still come out there, they still come into the pharmacy, they still come in to buy really simple remedies. Um, it doesn't have to be like a really urgent matter. Um, so we still have to be there. It was difficult trying to get them to understand that. Um, but I think as, as, as a community and as, as a society, what was interesting to see was the shift in everyone's attitude to accept the changes that were happening. So accept social distancing, um, queuing up, for things you know before if you were to tell someone to queue outside of the pharmacy i guarantee they would not return to the pharmacy 100 percent. but now it's very very normal um and i think as in the household as well you you see that change um and, do, and as dr um Aral nancy said um it, it's, it was one of the positives because you see everyone's attitude is actually you know i think from from a mental health perspective i don't know if down the, down the you know in the future there will be a strain um, from that aspect because of the um, COVID situation and sort of a knock-on effect. But right now, it's, you know, the sun is shining, people are out, um, people are exercising more, they're cycling, they're walking, jogging to work. Um, it's So it was very interesting for me to see everyone's positive attitude to the situation and how they accepted it and handled um, the changes. So, yeah, I think it was difficult to um, get them to understand initially, but they... Um, so collectively as a society everyone's attitudes attitudes have changed which has helped um the strain of the whole situation i think that's really nice to know it's nice to end on a positive note i really like the positive contributions towards the end um and um i'd like to thank all the speakers who have taken the time the attendees i know we've overrun by probably about half an hour than we I think we only anticipated to be for it to be a 60 minute call, but it's been fantastic to hear your, your experiences. Um, it's been great that the audience have um, have joined in, asked questions. So um, thank you all for attending. Um, if you want to hear more about the Rights Collective or uh, subscribe to our newsletter, Nishma, we'll put our link at the end of the chat. For you to all um to, to for you to all to press and link on if you if you want to pass your email details to us uh, and then you'll be um sent um in your inbox details of future events other initiatives that we're involved in um and it will just keep us um informed as to what you're what you're doing and where if dr nero um is happy to do so would be happy to share your presentation um with the audience um and our subscribers so that would be great so um, thank you all for coming. Um, again, I can't thank everyone enough. Um, it's been a really insightful 90 minutes um, and um, fingers crossed for the future. Thank you.